Hi, welcome back. This week, I'd like to talk about why the lies coming from the right wing and the Republican leadership are getting even more outrageous and why I suspect they will continue to get more outrageous. First, I'll give you a few examples of increasingly outrageous lies from the past week. Republican Congressman Andrew Clyde, when talking about what happened at the Capitol on January 6th, said, to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bald-faced lie. He went on to say that if you didn't know the footage was from January 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. On Friday, Texas Representative Louis Gohmert said there is no evidence of an armed insurrection. He said no firearms had been confiscated, which is completely untrue. To give you one more example of a crazy lie, Senator Rand Paul and Tucker Carlson, Fox News host, implied that Dr. Fauci is responsible for the outbreak of COVID. I'll put links to the sources in the notes so you can see for yourself the degree to which people in the right-wing information universe are given reason to doubt basic provable facts. I've already talked a little bit about why people like Tucker Carlson and Senator Rand Paul and Congressman Andrew Andrew Clyde and others tell these kinds of lies. In a video a few weeks ago called Fascist Lies, I quoted Frederick Pinchelstein, who explains that the liars often understand that the lies are not literally true, but they believe their lies are in service to a higher truth. This is sort of the, the ends justify as the means argument. If telling the lie achieves the result we need, we justify the lie. What's startling from the recent polling is how many people believe these lies. We can see how many people are willingly going along with the lies. One of my followers on Twitter asked me this. Why do people prefer myth? I just do not understand the mass appeal. One part of what's going on is that the lies destroy and they want to destroy. The lies suck it to their enemies and they want to suck it to their enemies. Before I get into the ugly stuff about how lies can destroy democracy, it's worth pausing to say that myths are not always harmful and destructive. For example, when dealing with a six-year-old and a loose tooth, the myth of the tooth fairy comes in handy. Also, psychologist Carl Jung talks a lot about how myths serve an important psychological function. I don't think a Jungian psychologist would approve of me phrasing it this way, but as I understand Carl Jung, our brains are sort of hardwired to embrace myths. Myths and metaphors can help us understand or make sense of the world. The world isn't really a stage, but the metaphor helps us understand something about how some people live their lives. I also think we're all sort of inclined to believe lies that make us feel good. Donald Trump, for example, tells these guys that they are the top of the hierarchy, and if they don't have everything they deserve, it's because undeserving others, people who are not real Americans, are trying to replace them and take what's theirs. That's an appealing lie for these guys. Another reason people embrace lies is because the lies confirm an idea they have about the world. The Christian far right, for example, believes that Trump was sent by God to save America. Well, if you believe that, how do you explain the fact that God let Trump lose the election? If you believe God sent Trump to save America, the only possible explanation is that the Democrats stole the election and subverted God's will. What's Trump supposed to save America from? I'll get to that. Also, Trump's brand is based on winning. When the election was approaching, I was a little curious what would happen after Trump lost. If you build your brand on winning, how do you explain a loss? Turns out the answer is simple. Just deny you lost. Some people embrace lies because they don't know how to evaluate sources. They get so blitzed by all the conflicting versions of the truth that they conclude the truth is unknowable. They conclude it's better not to listen to the news at all. Instead, they listen to someone in their community who they think knows. Well, what I'm going to talk about now are the kind, a particular kind of lie, the lies that are intended to destroy liberal democracy. First, a definition. Liberal democracy is a form of represented democracy with free and fair elections and a competitive political process. All adults are given the right to vote. According to this definition, America has only been a liberal democracy since the modern civil rights and women's rights movements. Before 1954, racial segregation was illegal. What we now call voter suppression laws were legal. In some places, Blacks who tried to vote were killed. One incident is called the Election Day Massacre, which occurred when a Black man tried to vote in Florida in 1920. Because of racial segregation, some Black communities were entirely cut off from white America, giving lie to another myth 
that we all have equal opportunities. So if person A gets ahead of person B, it means person A is more resourceful and worthy of things like tax breaks. It wasn't until the federal legislation of the 1960s that we came, in, came anywhere close to a liberal democracy. So yes, the Republicans are trying to destroy democracy. Another way of saying the same thing is that the Republicans want to take us back to the days when America and our institutions were entirely ruled by white men. But it wasn't that long ago. If you were born, say, after 1980, it feels like ancient history, but it isn't. The white men now in charge of the Republican Party remember those days. They grew up in an America in which white men controlled all of America's institutions, courts, universities, political parties. Someone in the comments suggested that I talk about books I find helpful. I highly recommend How Democracies Die by Harvard professors Ziblatt and Levitsky. One thing the authors say is that ethnic majorities rarely give up their dominant status without a fight. In a lecture, which I'll link to in the notes, Professor Levitsky says that we're going through a political earthquake as America transitions from a nation ruled by white men to a true liberal democracy. The political parties between, say, 1920 and 1960 were fairly civil to each other. That's because they weren't that different. Both parties were entirely dominated by white men. So one way to see what's happening is that liberal democracy in America is trying to take hold for the first time. So now, back to liars and destructive lies. Another book I found helpful was Richard Hofstadter's The Paranoid Style in American Politics. Keep in mind that Hofstadter wrote this in the early 1960s. On his mind was McCarthyism, which, as Seth Kotler, a historian, recently pointed out, was also based on a big lie, an entirely fabricated list of 57 known communists. Again, I'll put a link to the sources in the notes with this video. Anyway, writing just after McCarthyism, Hofstadter conducted a thorough review of American politics from before the founding of the nation through McCarthyism, and he noticed a pattern among a small and passionate minority on the fringes of the political spectrum. He called their behavior the paranoid style in politics. He explained that those embracing the paranoid style believe that unseen satanic forces are trying to destroy something larger in which they belong. According to Hofstadter, the something larger to which they belong is generally phrased as the American way of life. They feel dispossessed. They feel that America is being taken away from them, and they're determined to repossess it and prevent what they see as the final act of subversion. They therefore adopt extreme measures. They'll stop at nothing to prevent what they see as an impending calamity. These apocalyptic warnings arouse a passion and militancy. The evil enemy must be destroyed and the fight must go beyond the ordinary give and take of politics. In other words, they'll play dirty. Newt Gingrich captured this frustration and called to militancy when he said Republicans must resort to any means necessary. During the McCarthy era, and then the Goldwater campaign, Hofstadter concluded that the paranoid elements were no longer contained on the far right wing fringes. He noted that some of the worst traits of this paranoid right were moving into mainstream politics and perhaps becoming more permanent. This makes sense because that was just when the changes brought about by the modern civil rights and women's rights movements were taking root, which stirred the militancy and passion of the paranoid right. You can see how this fits together. The right wing believes they're losing something and they desperately want to hold on to it. This desperate feeling brings us back to the idea of a political earthquake. But the Republicans have a problem. Their demographics are shrinking. The goal of holding on to an era when white men ruled is getting harder to achieve. For them, it feels like they're drowning. If they don't stop it, the America they believe once existed will be lost forever. That's what make America great again it's all about. It's about taking America back to a place, back to a time when white men ruled. The America they long for is a myth. Heather Cox Richardson talks about the myth of the cowboy, a white man worked hard, was self-reliant and came to the savage land and didn't need government help. David DeBeaver, a popular sitcom from the late 50s and early 60s, presented a mythic America. Blacks are happy servants. Little white boys are plucky and mischievous, and we expect them to get into trouble now and then. Mom wears an apron and uncomfortable shoes, and she dusts and cleans, smiling the entire time. Dad is the man of the house. This is what they think they're losing. This is what they want back. 
This brings me to another reason people embrace the lies. People will embrace lies if they think the lie points to a deeper truth. When fact checker, fact checker Daniel Dale pointed out to Sarah Huckabee Sanders one of Trump's lies, she said, the lie is pointing out an important truth. Do you not care about the important truth? For example, birtherism. That was a provable lie, but it resonated with people who believe that someone black isn't a real American and shouldn't be in power. Remember when Sarah Palin talked about real Americans? She took a lot of heat for that because it was obvious she was talking in code and that real Americans are white and small town or rural. Jay Rosen, professor of journalism at NYU, quoted this from a recent Washington Post piece. If anything, the Republican Party today is even more committed to myths, falsehoods, and a shared hostility to the very idea of an objective reality on which a democratic debate might be built than they were when Trump was still president. Yes, the lying has escalated. The lying is escalating because the Republicans lost. They're feeling more desperate. They think if they don't win the next election, their vision of America will be lost forever. And actually, they're probably right. If the Democrats keep the House and win a larger majority in the Senate, it will get harder for them to stop minorities from voting, and the whites will lose their, even more of their majority. They lie because the lies destroy liberal democracy. This is what Jay Rosen was getting at. Democracy is based on rule of law, which requires a shared factuality. Imagine a court of law when half the jurors or even the judge says, I don't believe what you're showing me. The head of my political party said the truth is something else, and I believe him. White supremacy is based on a lie. I mentioned earlier that the blitz of lies can make people feel that objective truth is unknowable. That's why the Republican Party is letting loose with a fire hose of falsehoods. Well, will they win? I don't think so, unless the rest of us become complacent. They're outnumbered and their numbers are shrinking. And that's why they're desperate. That's why they're unleashing all these crazy lies. The more it looks like they're going to lose, the more desperate they're going to become and the more outlandish their lies will be. So I think you can expect the fire hose of falsehoods to continue. I suggest you all put on your raincoats so you're prepared. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I think I'll do another one of these next Sunday. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. And thank you again for joining me.